Hello, and welcome to the Kaiser Permanente Speaker Series, where today we will be discussing specialty care and the art of patient-centered care. I am looking forward to a great discussion, and I hope you are too. I am Allison Renz. I will be your host and conversation moderator today. I am manager of strategic accounts here in the Northwest region, and I have the privilege of working with our largest public sector customers in the state of Oregon and in Washington. Before I introduce our physician guests, I thought I would share a quick story about my own member experience with specialty care here at Kaiser Permanente. I think it really illustrates what makes KP different and unique. So that's story time. Uh, back when I was a young teen, I was diagnosed with scoliosis. Um, in fact, I wore a back brace for several character building years in middle school. Um, after becoming an adult and after several pregnancies, uh, I found myself in some pretty bad lower back pain. Uh, through my primary care physician, I was connected with a host of resources to support my back health, uh, which included a referral to the KP spine specialist. My amazing specialist um, ordered imaging. Um, he discussed options with me. Uh, he connected me with physiatry. And thanks to the shared medical record, my team was able to view all of my images, my test results, see what treatment I had been utilizing. And most importantly, I didn't have to keep repeating my story or play quarterback on my own health. Um, everything was proactively coordinated on my behalf between the different departments, um, and it really made a huge difference. So with that, thank you for letting me share a bit about my story. Uh, let's go ahead and meet some of the amazing specialists that we have here today. Dr. Christine Barnett has worked for Kaiser Permanente for 10 years and is our medical director of our cancer center here in the Northwest region. Dr. Elizabeth Melendez is the assistant chief of obstetrics and gynecology and has practiced with Kaiser Permanente for the past seven years. Welcome, Dr. Melendez. Dr. Chip Robertson has been with Kaiser Permanente for 16 years and serves as our Assistant Chief of Cardiology. Really quick, couple housekeeping items. All of your mics have been muted and your cameras have been turned off. However, please do use the chat function and ask any questions that you may have as we go through the presentation today. We will get to some of your questions at the end of our time together. Okay, so let's jump right in. Is everybody ready? Okay, the first question is going to be for all of our doctors to answer. So let's start with you, Dr. Barnett. Can you tell us why you chose to practice at Kaiser Permanente? Yeah, there are a few reasons, um, but one of the main reasons is that um, practicing at KP, I could spend time um, with what matters to patients and not have to focus on generating RVUs um, and really um, give that uh, quality care to the patient that they deserve. In addition, this is an organization that really allows the care providers to affect change for their patients. If we feel like there's something that needs to be improved, we're really empowered to do that for our patients, which is um, uh, very, very good when you're seeing um, uh, very um, sick patients daily. Dr. Melendez, would you like to share how you came to practice at Kaiser Permanente? Yes, I, I agree with all of the things that Dr. Barnett just shared. 
Um, I also want to add that to, to your point earlier, Allison, the opportunity to practice in a system where I have ready access to all of my patients' records and access to resources and colleagues who can help me care for my patients beyond their reproductive needs was really important to me. Um, I also wanted to be part of a system where I could care for patients using the best available medical evidence that could support that practice and that could ensure exceptional quality of care. Let's go to the next question. Um, I'll have you all answer this one as well. Um, let's start with you, Dr. Barnett. Can you tell us a little bit more about the scope of care in your department at KP? Yeah, I'm actually here representing two um, parts, uh, well, two departments really. So I'm the medical director of our cancer center, and I'm also the chief of uh, medical oncology. So really, um, the scope of the cancer center, we really consider ourselves a, a, another medical home um, where patients really, when you have cancer, you, you're seeing us a lot. You're getting a lot of your care here all the time, multiple times a month. Um, so our scope is really treating the entire patient um, through their cancer journey. And it's it, exactly what Dr. Melinda said about having ready access to other specialists and other people um, who are experts in other aspects of their care really helps me get that care that is needed for the patient, um, even if it's not the cancer care. But I'm seeing them a lot, so I want them to kind of feel like we're taking care of the whole person. Um, there are many, many departments that are represented by the Cancer Center, and we all work together um, very closely uh, to make sure that the cancer care um, experience is seamless for the patient. Yes, um, I'm really happy to say that for any patient who presents to us with complex medical conditions, we're really able to collaborate with our maternal fetal medicine subspecialists within our own department and subspecialists outside of our department, like Dr. Mark Barnett with the medical oncology or cardiology, neurology, really whatever needs that patient might have and collaborate to provide them with the best possible outcome um, of uh, a pregnancy. We also are able to really get same day communication from these subspecialists sometimes as needed, which provides significant reassurance to our patients in that moment. Um, and then when they are close to delivery, we create care plans in coordination with the multidisciplinary hospital team that's going to deliver these patients. That includes anesthesiology, nursing, a midwife, if the patient desires that kind of care, and an OB hospitalist. Could you maybe tell us, Dr. Robertson, why did you choose to practice at KP and then a little bit about your department? My apologies. Sure. Uh, thank you. My um, uh, my story in deciding to practice at KP is very similar to the stories you've already heard, and I would echo a lot of the same sentiments. Uh, I joined KP uh, straight out of fellowship uh, now about 16 years ago. And at that time of my life, I'd spent 10 years becoming a cardiologist, and I'd spent zero of those years becoming a businessman. And when I was comparing the, the offers for jobs that were in private fee-for-service practice compared to Kaiser Permanente, I realized that in fee-for-service world, I'd be spending a lot of time learning to be a businessman. And uh, in at KP, I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to really spend nearly 100% of my time on patient-focused care. Uh, directly involved. Um, so that, that in a nutshell is why I joined uh, Kaiser Permanente. Um, th the scope of the cardiac care at, um, at KP Northwest is comprehensive and, 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 and broad. Uh, for uh, patients age 18 on up, we provide the entire suite of cardiac care from all imaging modalities, inpatient, outpatient care, and all types of cardiac services uh, with the only exclusion being cardiac transplantation. And we incorporate our uh, cardiac uh, transplant patients about three months um, uh, after transplant. Um, so uh, this involves um, about 20 department members, uh, 10 echocardiogram techs, and it, it just goes on. It's a pretty um, 
pretty uh, large group of people uh, that we have providing cardiac care for our patients. And it goes beyond uh, that in that we uh, uh, have a strong supportive relationship with all of our other disciplines and specialties uh, where we're relied upon in real time often to offer advice how best to manage a uh, patient's medication options for uh, mental health treatment, for example, because those could have cardiac treatment or implications, you know, as well as simply how to uh, best arrange um, uh, a safe surgery for a patient that's a non-cardiac surgery, and, and it goes on. And I think we'll be talking more about that uh, with the other questions, uh, but suffice it to say that we provide a very comprehensive uh, scope of cardiac care. Absolutely. And I'm very excited to hear more about that, as you mentioned. So, Dr. Barnett, I'd like to start with you. Can you discuss the collaborative nature of cancer care at Kaiser Permanente? Yeah, that's really the name of the game here um, at our cancer center at um, Kaiser Permanente is collaboration. Really out in the community <clears throat> and even in academia, most cancer care is in silos. You go from one department to another. They might communicate with each other by sending notes, faxing even, because um, we still do that in medicine, like it's the 1980s. Um, but here, we are consider we consider all of the patient's experience to be their cancer care, regardless of what department they're in. So um, there's a a significant amount of collaboration between the care providers uh, for cancer care for our patients. Um, one of the main things we have done is we've instituted case conferences for every cancer. So what that is, is every new cancer for almost every cancer type is discussed at a multidisciplinary conference weekly. So every single person who would be involved in that cancer care can weigh in and give an opinion on the patient um, from radiation to medical oncology to surgery to nutrition to PT, everybody is involved in the multidisciplinary care of that patient and it's equitable across the board. Some places have multidisciplinary clinics, but you can only, only get a few patients into those. This is a multidisciplinary approach for every single patient, regardless of the complexity of their case per se. Not only is collaboration with care providers important, but we actually have to collaborate with our patients as well because they are really the voice of the experience. So we have really robust um, programs set up where we actually have patient navigators, peer navigators, who have been our patients who have gone through specific training to help other patients get through uh, the complexity of the cancer process emotionally. I tell my patients often that having cancer is a full-time job. There's a lot of a lot of appointments you need to go to, a lot of things you need to go to, and a lot of other things that kind of get put on the way uh, at the wayside while you're dealing with all of this. And sometimes you need more than just um, physician or nursing support for that. In addition, we have a patient advisory council that can review kind of new initiatives that we're planning and see if they feel like these are beneficial for the patients. In addition, we collaborate with something we talked about, which is um, the, the um, social and community needs for the patient. Um, so we collaborate with our community partners to help with things like, like I said, a full-time job. So who's going to take care of the kids? Who's going to help with groceries? Who's going to help with all those things that may be difficult when you're having to go to so many appointments for your cancer. So um, we really want to make sure that this is considered one experience for the patient so they don't have to be that um, uh, person that is having to be um, proactive at making sure that they get to where they need to go, that we can help navigate that for them. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm sure your patients appreciate that wraparound support. Dr. Melendez, um, as a women's health specialist, can you elaborate on the collaborative process and the communication strategies that you and your team use to ensure seamless coordination um, and integrated care for women with complex health conditions? Um, sure. I think that pretty much exactly what Dr. Barnett just said is, is the approach that we take in our department as well. And I'm sure our other colleagues will, will share similar stories, but essentially um, 
any patient that presents to us, whether they are considered low risk without prior medical conditions or those who do have uh, known medical conditions are cared for in a holistic manner. We really attempt to address all their needs to ensure the best possible outcome. So as I stated before, if that means uh, constant communication with an endocrinologist or a cardiologist or other subspecialist who have been caring for the patient uh, outside of pregnancy, we are in contact with them during um, uh, the pregnancy as well and help uh, coordinate any adjustments to their medications or appointments or care that they need, again, to optimize the outcomes. Uh, we're really seeking to care for our patients throughout the continuum of their lives. And from the beginning of that journey, that can be you know, preconception counseling or optimization of health prior to a pregnancy or evaluation and assistance of infertility needs if needed. Um, and then again, managing those pregnancies, whether they're high or low risk. And then beyond those reproductive years, we're managing patients, again, in that collaborative model uh, into uh, menopause, uh, addressing needs such as incontinence or cancers of the uterus, ovaries, and cervix. And for that care, we lean on our gynecologic oncologists and our urogynecology subspecialists as well. Great, thank you. Well, I love that you talk about the whole uh, lifetime of care that is required and um, we appreciate that. Dr. Robertson, can you discuss the collaborative nature specific to cardiac care at Kaiser Permanent K? Uh, sure, I'd, I'd be delighted to. There's, uh, I think, two aspects of this that come to mind. The, the first aspect is internally, how do we collaborate together as cardiac providers to provide care for our patients? And that involves uh, uh, our interventional cardiologists combined with our card general cardiologists and our cardiac surgeons, uh, as well as our imaging specialists, to come together uh, and collaboratively assess the, the needs for the patient and devise a treatment plan that provides the best outcome for the patient. And, and that's a team-based approach that we um, uh, have had in the culture of Kaiser uh, since its inception. Um, the second aspect of that is, I think, how we communicate with our colleagues uh, that are relying on us, on us for uh, opinions on better on how to uh, facilitate patient care outside of the world of cardiology. And as has been mentioned many times uh, by, by my colleagues on the screen, I'm often the one at the other end of the phone call that they're that they're calling to say. You know, how can we best manage this patient's hypertension uh, or their lipid status or evaluate symptoms? So the, the utilization of the electronic medical record that allows us to communicate freely and rapidly in real time with each other, um, as well as um, a, a strong culture of collaboration across um, multi-disciplines uh, is, uh, is a tantamount to, um, to our approach at, at Kaiser. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, last question in this section. Dr. Barnett, in dealing with challenging cases that require multidisciplinary expertise, how do you foster a culture of teamwork and mutual respect among different experts, such as surgeons, cardiologists, nurses, other healthcare staff um, to achieve the best possible outcomes for the patient? Yeah, um, so I think the key to that is bringing all of these um, care providers in um, at the outset. So um, not only do we have case conferences to discuss the patient's actual cases, but we have task forces for each cancer. And these meet outside um, of clinical care, and it is really any care provider that would be um, working on uh, a patient cancer. So um, for instance, um, Dr. Melendez mentioned um, our gynecologic oncologist. So we have a gynecologic oncology task force that has our gynecologic oncologist, our medical oncologist, our radiation oncologist. We've got nutritionists, PT, radiology, pathology, and what it is, is they meet and they talk about best practices and ways to improve the care for the patients. And everybody has an equal um, say 
in what they feel like would help be helpful for the patients. Importantly, when we started these task forces, we actually had patients come in to do patient mapping. So what would happen is they would journey map and they would say, hey, I'm a patient who had uterine cancer and here was my experience. And we would map it out and we would talk about where some care gaps were, how could we improve things? And it might've been nutrition. Could they come in and do this? And so it, it could have been the medical oncology that needed um, uh, tweaking. And so if you involve all of the care providers in the care of the patient at baseline, then it's incredibly easy to get everybody to collaborate at a moment's notice for a patient. Like Dr. Melendez was saying, you can get specialty advice sometimes within minutes um, on a patient because we already have these relationships and these task forces created. And that's one of the best things about KP. Not only is our electronic medical record kind of integrated, but I feel like all of our care is integrated with each other where we, we really know each other quite well and we talk to each other. And it's a very, very good collaborative nature between providers um, that really helps move the care of the patient forward. Dr. Robertson, next one is for you. Patient empowerment is a crucial element of individualized care. Can you tell us how you and your team involve patients in decision making and treatment planning to best manage their heart health? Absolutely. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this kind of builds on the last question where we talked about a heart team or a multidisciplinary heart team based approach to solving, deciding which is the best treatment plan, it's important to recognize that the patient is part of that team. Uh, they're, they're an integral part of the uh, healthcare decision-making team. And we have uh, adopted as best practices the concept of shared decision-making that fully incorporates the patient as the leader of the healthcare team. And uh, we have uh, validated and developed multiple shared decision-making tools that we incorporate routinely in our practice. A great example of this is for the treatment of atrial fibrillation, which is about 30% of our uh, clinic volume uh, visits are attributable to atrial fibrillation. And for every patient, we incorporate a shared decision-making tool to teach them about the, their diagnosis, the available treatment options, and then collaboratively with uh, uh, the, uh, the assistance of this information uh, to bring the patient on board into sharing with us their preferences and really drive uh, the final decision of the treatment plan. Another example of this that we um, uh, incorporate fully is all the way up into uh, complicated cardiac procedures uh, like the implantation of, of um, um, implantable cardiac defibrillators. It's a best practice and an actual requirement of our department to document utilization of shared decision-making with a patient you know, prior to pr pursuing that type of treatment. So we really focus in on uh, incorporating the patient as the leader of their, of their uh, multidisciplinary heart team. Um, we don't really um, stop though at the provider and patient level. We have a whole suite of um, cardiac rehabilitation services and uh, advice nurses uh, as well as other support staff, nutrition and dietitians, and a social worker embedded within the department, all of them listening carefully uh, to advocate for patient concerns and bring those to the to the attention of the of the cardiologist. Um, and so uh, uh, we take to heart that's a bad pun, but we really take uh, to heart the um, uh, that the patient should be the leader of their team. Thank you. Keep the puns coming. <laughs> um, Dr. Melendez, how do you approach patient education and empowerment to ensure that women are well informed and actively involved in their healthcare decisions? Yes, uh, one of the things I, I love about our department is uh, how much time and energy we have invested in the um, literature that patients receive when they initiate care with us um, on the gynecologic side of their care, but um, most robustly on the obstetric side. They have uh, material that we ourselves have created um, that really help guide patients through their journey of pregnancy, delivery, and then that first very important year after um, delivery. Um, we 
really focused on shared decision making uh, with our patients. And I really want to highlight the work that our midwives do to impress upon uh, patients uh, the fact that they have a very strong voice in how um, their care will proceed and what kind of planning we can uh, make around their birth experience. Um, our midwives are huge advocates for um, implementing trauma-informed care in every aspect of our care delivery system. And so uh, whether that's approaching patients um, from the standpoint of, of consent to uh, just a, a touch, right? Things that in the past have been very much taken for granted as it uh, pertains to care of um, the reproductive age um, uh, patient. We are um, really learning from each other and from our patients how best to provide that care and, and really how to provide them with appropriate pain management during that care as well. Okay, let's go to our next section. I'm excited for this one. Um, the hard next section is cutting edge care. So Dr. Robertson, I'd like to start with you. As the field of cardiology advances, how do you and your teams stay attuned to the latest care trends and incorporate innovative practices into your approach to ensure the best care experience for our members? Yeah, I think um, um, this builds yet on another theme um, that we uh, start off with as a multidisciplinary team that gets together at least once a month, once a week, I'm sorry, for a conference. And the focus of that conference is both a working conference to uh, develop a, a consensus opinion on what's the best uh, treatment to provide the best long-term outcome for a patient, uh, but we also use that conference to integrate and evaluate um, emerging technologies and emerging treatments. And we often incorporate them in real time in that, mo in that moment. We also are a large enough sensor with a large enough volume that we attract um, uh, participation in device trials uh, uh, to some degree and a smaller degree um, to medication trials. And so we are at the forefront of, um, of uh, emerging technologies and we have those available oftentimes to our patients uh, in real time. You know, the interesting thing about uh, working at Kaiser Permanente is we often are a little bit ahead of the curve. For example, we mentioned that we have a multidisciplinary based heart team approach, and that's been the case for decades at Kaiser Permanente. And in the 2021 American, Cardi American College of Cardiology uh, coronary revascularization guidelines, they strongly recommend that all uh, health centers have a heart, heart team approach. Uh, so I'm glad that they caught up with us. Uh, and those same words appear in the um, heart failure guidelines, most recent edition, as well as the valvular heart disease guidelines. Uh, so we're already there. And, you know, I'm happy to say that I think as a result of our implementation of technologies and staying on the current edge, you know, our cardiac surgery program has had three out of three stars in the um, Society of Thoracic Surgery rating system since its, since its inception. And in the past three years, we've been in the 50 best hospitals for cardiac surgery nationwide. And that ex also extends into our outcomes uh, for heart attack care, where our 30-day mortality is above expectation. Or so our survival rates are, are beating the average for what you would think for our uh, patient uh, population. Um, uh, so those are the, the, the principal ways that we uh, involve emerging technologies. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, um, just knowing that makes me uh, sleep better at night, <laughs> truly. So <laughs> thank you for sharing. Dr. Barnett, um, in what ways do you incorporate cutting edge research and treatment advancements into the way that you and the rest of the KP team manage care? And how does that impact your patients specifically? Yeah, so um, at the end of the day, um, the uh, cutting edge treatments and um, research that we are involved in here really highlight how good we are at complex care. So Kaiser Permanente is 
because of the integration and because of our access to all these cutting edge things, we are incredibly good at complex care. So much so that um, a study was done that if you have Kaiser Permanente insurance, you're a 20% less likely to prematurely die of your cancer than if you have others. So um, that's some pretty impressive um, uh, stuff. We've got a lot of efforts that we have done to make sure that we are doing evidence-based and cutting edge um, uh, treatments for our patients. We are COC accredited, which is Commission on Cancer Accreditation, which is a very involved um, accreditation involving making sure that you are doing clinical trials and all of those things. We actually have an award from the National Cancer Institute for um, an NIH award. Um, it's called NCORP. It's the um, NCI Community Cancer Research Program. We have an award for uh, the most accruals um, to these clinical trials. We have a very robust cl clinical trial suite um, for our patients, um, so they have access to a lot of those. Um, and then Dr. Robertson mentioned the Society for Thoracic Surgery. Another thing that um, is notable is um, for our um, cancer surgeries for esophageal and lung cancer, we have a three-star STS rating uh, for both. And there's only two other programs in the entire nation that have that designation. So every aspect of cancer care um, is covered with cutting edge um, uh, treatments, research, surgeries, um, you name it. Great, thank you so much for sharing. Okay, let's go to our next section. Um, let's talk a little bit about how KP compares to other health systems. Dr. Barnett, I'm gonna start with you. Um, other health systems talk a lot about their integrated approach to care, um, but I think none are truly as integrated as KP. Can you help give me a couple uh, examples where those kinds of differences have shown up for KP members in your care? Yeah, it really comes back to what I mentioned before about in the community and academia, um, things are very, very siloed. Um, <clears throat> and you're kind of shuffled from one place to another with kind of minimal communication um, between these departments. <clears throat> Whereas here, it's all one place, all one communication. The best example of this is our nurse navigation program. So we have nurse navigators that actually um, bring the patient into the cancer fold at the outset and really get things moving for the patient so that there is minimal sleepless nights where they're wondering, now that they have this diagnosis, what do they do? The best example we have is in breast cancer. So what happens um, is when a patient gets a breast biopsy, it's done by radiology, and we have a system where they send the breast biopsy results directly to our breast cancer nurse navigators. Those nurse navigators reach out, the, out to the patient sometime the same, oftentimes the same day, next day. Um, they give them the diagnosis, and they have protocols to implement a plan. So it's one thing to get a diagnosis. It's another thing to get a, to get a diagnosis and a plan right away. So they are empowered to um, order things like PET scans or additional um, tests if needed. So that by the time the patient presents to the first physician, they have everything that they need. They're empowered to get what we call germline hereditary uh, cancer testing, which will then um, affect the treatment that is recommended for the patient. Those nurse navigators then bring those patients' cases to our weekly case conference. So it ensures that the patient gets to the right care provider at the right time. Sometimes what you'll see happen in, in other systems is that somebody will get a diagnosis of breast cancer per se. They will get referred to medical oncology immediately. It takes a little while to get that appointment sometimes, and especially um, not in KP. Um, you wait for the appointment, you go to the medical oncologist to say, oh, you should have seen the surgeon first. Um, and so now you have to wait for an appointment with surgery. The way we do it is, is we ensure if the patient needs to see medical oncology first, they see medical oncology first. If they need to see surgery first, they see surgery first. And by the time the patient sees, say, the surgeon, they have the imaging that is needed so they can say, hey, we can schedule the surgery next week or however quickly they need to because all of the studies have been done. That is incredible integration and we can move the care forward very, very quickly for patients. And our time to first treatment, we track this and it's incredibly low for our for our patients. 
Thank you. Dr. Melendez, how does Kaiser Permanente differ from other health systems and practices from your perspective? Yes, I think um, we've we've all shared similar stories on this, but I, I can continue. We um, are able to provide our patients with that seamless care throughout their pregnancy journey for those who are pregnant. Um, so if someone uh, comes in, for example, uh, using an insulin pump for their type 1 diabetes diagnosis, uh, we coordinate with their endocrinologist to allow them to continue using that pump during their pregnancy to manage and update the settings on it. And even once they're on labor and delivery, we are able to continue that treatment and uh, keep that patient um, under the care that has um, helped them feel most confident that they uh, in, um, in addressing their uh, diabetic needs. Um, we also have uh, a midwife um, a service that is very actively involved in patient care, whether that's in the outpatient setting or in the inpatient setting. They essentially serve as the primary care uh, giver and call upon us, the physicians, uh, for consultation. And we will oftentimes manage patients in coordination uh, with each other, allowing the patient to get that uh, midwives expertise in low risk obstetric care while also leaning on the physician uh, who might be managing whatever medical condition they come in uh, into our care with. And so that, um, that sort of coordinated care um, that happens in real time, I think is really unique to our practice and to the service that we offer our pregnant patients. Thank you. Dr. Robertson, um, I know you alluded to a little bit of this earlier, but same question for you. How does AP differ from other health systems or practices um, from the perspective of cardiology? Yeah, I think the, the one of the major ways that we differ is um, the full integration of healthcare services here. Uh, and that allows us to be uh, collaborative within the department and 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 without the and external to the department as well. And importantly, it allows us to focus uh, nearly 100% of our, our our active time at work on focusing on patient care instead of obtaining prior or pre-authorization uh, instead of arguing about uh, compensation. And you know, notice I said that we are able to uh, focus our time on patient care not necessarily on RVU generation. And that's in the world of cardiology, that's an important uh, distinction. Uh, it'll, it removes us um, the pressure uh, to make decisions based upon what generates revenue for the health system or what generates revenue for a personal cardiologist and allows us to focus in on what's the best treatment to provide the best long-term outcome for a patient. And I'll give you an example of this is that we have a role um, uh, that a cardiologist, one cardiologist does all day, every day, uh, on a ro rotating basis, of course, is to be what's called a virtual cardiologist. And this cardiologist is available in real time to provide uh, advice to any other specialist or primary care provider uh, who needs uh, a little bit of help or coaching or just uh, advice assessing the care needs of a patient in that moment and, and coordinating care. That role in a fee-for-service uh, realm would provide zero RVU generation, provide zero income generation for the patients. But what we've discovered is that this allows our primary care providers to order the right test, uh, to get the right information, to provide the cardiac specialist when the patient has a consultation, the information that they need. And we've seen that that facilitation of care has real value in real time. And just recently, I had a patient uh, with a 13-year-old a uh, prosthetic aortic valve uh, came to my attention uh, through a primary care provider that their valve wasn't functioning normally, uh, which was a sudden change. And we got that patient uh, care within hours for what they needed 
the right test ordered, and I'm going to see them next week, and um, I, I know what's happening with the patient. So it's a great example of how um, uh, focusing on patient care as opposed to RV generation um, uh, leads to better outcomes. Um, let's go to you, Dr. Melendez. Um, as we know, reproductive rights are being challenged across the country. Can you explain how the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade has impacted access to care? Well, fortunately here um, in the state of Oregon and within Kaiser Permanente, I can proudly say that this decision has not uh, impacted um, access to care for our patients. Um, we have been able to uh, continue providing the excellent family planning care uh, that we always have. Um, what has happened is we've um, increased the um, amount of clinical time that we uh, provide to OHSU and their family planning fellowship program so that we can support the increased need to train family planning subspecialists. So we have more of them coming through our um, offices and our surgical uh, centers to uh, provide that uh, training. Um, we've also developed uh, clinical pathways to support any potential increase in uh, patient needs for reproductive care and family planning care uh, who might be coming from outside the state of Oregon because sadly, these decisions, um, uh, the Supreme Court's decision and then subsequent uh, uh, decisions made at state levels surrounding Oregon have impacted care in those states. And that has had the downstream effect of uh, patients seeking care outside of their state. So we have uh, created those pathways to support that need um, as it arises. Okay, I think we've got um, just a minute or two, and it looks like we've got um, a question from the audience. Um, and this is for Dr. Melendez. Can you discuss Kaiser Permanente's fertility capabilities and the partnerships that we have in the community to help families struggling with fertility? Good question. Sure, yes, an important one. Um, yes, yeah, so we are able to do full evaluations for any patient who is struggling with achieving a pregnancy and maintaining a pregnancy. Uh, that evaluation is done within our own uh, general gynecology uh, care, whether that's through um, serum blood tests or diagnostic um, procedures, uh, we provide that through our department. Uh, if a patient is uh, deemed to uh, perhaps need uh, medication to improve their fertility uh, wishes, we uh, prescribe those. If there is um, a uh, reason to uh, perform intrauterine insemination. We have capacity to do that within our department and system as well. And then once we've um, exhausted that, or if we already know in advance of any of that, that a patient actually needs um, higher um, care, such as in vitro fertilization, we have excellent referral uh, patterns and relationships with um, area infertility subspecialists that provide that care to our patients. And once they achieve pregnancy, they return to us uh, for their care. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for the question. I think that is all of the time that we have for today. I want to give a huge thank you to all of our physicians who have joined us today. I learned so much and I love seeing um, all of the passion that you bring to your work. So huge thank you for sharing. And thank you to everyone who came and listened today. We are uh, 
thrilled to get to share a little bit more about what we find um, to be so unique and wonderful about working at Kaiser Permanente. Um, I think there will be um, an opportunity to follow up with your account reps if you have any further questions.